Hello, welcome. My name is Andy, and this is Daily Philosophy. Today we want to talk about cyborgs. Cyborgs are not a new thing. For many decades, people have experimented with implants that provide new experiences and capabilities to the human body. But what exactly is a cyborg? The word cyborg comes from cybernetic organism, so it is commonly understood to be a being that is part man and part machine. It does not need to be a human, it can be any organism. There have been cyborg mice, for example, in experiments, or other cyborg animals. So you have an organism that is composed not only of biological parts, but also of electronic, technological, mechanical parts. But the important thing is that these artificial parts enhance the function of the organism in some way. Like all definitions, this one also can be understood in various ways, and it can be understood in a wider or in a narrower sense, and it can easily also be stretched beyond its breaking point. For example, a man with a bullet or a knife stuck in him is not a cyborg, because these things, although now they are part of his body, they don't really improve his function. The man is dead. What about a person with a tooth filling? You can argue that without the tooth filling, the person would be in pain and eventually perhaps would lose the tooth, while now with a the filling, they have a tooth that works. And we can even replace the tooth entirely with an artificial tooth, with a tooth replacement. These things exist. Many people have them. And these can even be better than natural teeth. They can last for decades and they are not affected by bacteria. They don't go bad. They don't decay in the same way like natural teeth do. So in this case, we would have a kind of improvement, an artificial part that is part of a human body and that improves the function of the human. There are already many such technological improvements available and in widespread use. So, for example, we can construct artificial limbs that replace limbs lost in an accident, arms or legs, even hands with fingers, and they can be constructed to be stronger than natural limbs. Or, for example, factory workers at Ford can strap into an exoskeleton, which is a kind of robotic skeleton outside of their body that gives them additional strength to move heavy components. The same for transport and logistics company DB Schenker. They have extensively tested exoskeletons for warehouse workers who have to carry heavy packages. Hearing aids and glasses, we all know they are everyday commonplace conveniences. And there's also the new trend of augmented reality glasses. I'm sure you've seen many YouTube videos about them that give the wearer new abilities. You can have a screen hanging in front of you and, and work there on your laptop with a virtual screen that is just project, projected in front of you. And that nobody else can see except you wearing these glasses. So whether one sees these devices as proper cyborg prosthetics is largely a matter of definition. Some would say that a cyborg prosthetic must be incorporated into the body. It must be a part of the body of the wearer. And it cannot be something that is easy to remove and to put aside. But this may be excessively narrow-minded. Is there, for example, a real difference between, let's say, your glasses and a pair of contact lenses and a pair of lenses that are perhaps surgically implanted into your eyes and provide the same function? It seems like these are just different degrees of integration with a human body but the abilities that they give the wearer are essentially the same, so they are not qualitatively really different things. A while ago there was an article for CNN Style, 
three Spanish advocates for cyborg rights, Victoria Modesta, Neil Harbison and Amal Grafstra, write the following. I quote this, if an implant is designed well, in other words, if it's frictionless, managementless, and you give it as much thought as you do your kidneys, in other words, none at all, then this is part of you. It is not a tool that you have picked up like a smartphone. It is actually changing your capabilities as a human being. And this is philosophically, fundamentally, and as I'm sure we are destined to see, goes the quote, legally different from any other tool. End of quote. But technological human augmentation can easily be taken further than just improving our physical strength or restoring the lost abilities of our senses. Since at least the 1970s, various activists have experimented with enhancing their bodies in ways that had not been seen or imagined earlier. The most prominent of this first generation of cyborgs is probably Professor Kevin Warwick, also known as Captain Cyborg. Since 1998, Warwick has implanted various chips into his body that directly interfaced his nervous system with external computing equipment. This allowed him, for example, to open doors remotely just by walking up to them or to switch the light in a room on when he enters the room. Other additions made it possible for him to control a robotic arm with the nerves of his own arm. Warwick's experiments were mostly aimed at researching how the human body would react to these kinds of implants and to these neural interfaces, and his work led to a better understanding of how we can construct artificial limbs, artificial parts that interface with our neural systems, and this can of course benefit accident victims with prosthetic limbs. In contrast to such research projects, a new generation of cyborg hackers, mostly artists, try to aggressively extend our understanding of what it means to be human. They do this by adding senses and abilities to the human body that we have never had before. The most prominent of the Spanish art scene cyborgs is probably Neil Harbison. Now around 40 years old, he still has a boyish charm about him. He's very articulate and he is a very inspiring speaker. Again, you can find videos with interviews with him all over YouTube. He was born with a rare condition that makes it impossible for him to see color. Harbison, therefore, had an antenna installed permanently into his skull at the age of 20. This antenna holds a sensor in the front of his head at eye level, and this sensor translates the color information that the camera sees into sounds, into essentially musical notes of various frequencies that Harbison can hear and interpret. So there is one musical note for yellow, there is one for magenta, there is one for red, there is one for blue, and by hearing these notes, Harbison can hear color. So in this way, he's not only able to see color, but also to see frequencies of light that we cannot see. His device can, for example, see infrared or ultraviolet. By interfacing the system to the internet, Harbison can receive callers from remote places. In 2014, he was planning to interface to his own satellite. I don't know what happened with this project. And so to have a third eye in space. This is what he said in an Al Jazeera interview, but I never found any information about what happened to this project. Another artist, Moon Rebus, co-founder of the Cyborg Foundation, to, together with Neil Harbison, has been experimenting with her own enhancements. But while Harbison can claim that his antenna is a prosthetic device that helps him compensate for a medical condition he was born with, Rebus does not have and does not perceive the need 
for such a justification. Art is reason enough for her to have various cybernetic devices connected to her body. In 2013, she connected an implant in her feet to online seismographs. These are devices that register earthquakes so that she can feel earthquakes with the soles of her feet that happen anywhere on Earth. And then she gives performances, and as part of her performance, an audience can watch her dance in sync to remote, unfelt, but real earthquakes. If there happens to be no earthquake at the time of the performance, the dancer will just stand still. So you go there and watch her standing still until somewhere there's an earthquake that she dances. Rebus added other senses to her repertoire through external devices, not all implants, so these would perhaps not qualify as cyborg extensions, but they're also very interesting. For example, she experimented with glasses that allow her to see only colors but no shapes, and gloves and earrings that can sense movement. With this earring, she was able to measure that the average speed of people walking on the street in Oslo and Rome is about two kilometers per hour lower than the speed of walking in London. A newer version of the earrings also gave her the ability to sense movement 360 degrees around her. And finally, cyborg artist Manuel Munoz, I hope I pronounced this correctly, born in 1996, implanted two weather fins into his head. These fins are sensors that can sense atmospheric pressure, humidity and temperature, and can also inform him about the elevation at which he is standing because the atmospheric pressure changes with the elevation. So if you can measure the atmospheric pressure, you know how high up you are. In 2017, he founded the Transpecies Society, an association that gives voice to people who do not identify as being 100% human and raises awareness on issues they face. The association, based in Barcelona, offers workshops specialized in the design and creation of new senses and organs. Looking at these few examples, and there are many more, one can see a whole range of motivations and ways of expressing cyborg identity. From Professor Warwick, who was driven by an academic curiosity, to Neil Harbison, who became a cyborg in order to have access to our normal world of colors, all the way to Manel Munoz with his weather fins. Cyborg activists cover a wide spectrum, from cases that are clearly attempts at therapy to cases of pure and largely pointless enhancement, everything doable is being done. Looking at elf-like Manel Munoz, dressed in bright white with his cute fairy ears attached, one is tempted to smile at the meaninglessness of these prosthetics. But there might be a darker side to it all. In a future that will likely be defined by large-scale unemployment as robots take away more and more jobs, the competition for the few remaining positions will become harsher. If governments don't manage to switch to a basic income economy in time, we could see widespread poverty and suffering. In a world like that, having new cybernetic senses could be a crucial distinguishing feature. Hearing gamma radiation could soon become an entry requirement for jobs in the atomic industry. Being able to register movement at 360 degrees would be an invaluable asset for every car driver or policeman. And if such procedures became really common, it would not take long until insurance companies would jump in and demand that such implants be fitted to anyone who wants to get a driving license. Wikipedia access implants could easily become mandatory for applicants for teaching jobs. Why risk that your secondary school biology teacher gets a minor fact about the anatomy of frogs wrong when you can have teachers who can live fact check everything on the internet? 
Doctors could have brain interfaces to medical databases and diagnostic AI systems and never make a mistake, and so on. It is possible that we are heading into a world where these enhancements will be perceived less and less as optional and increasingly as requirements for particular occupations and roles. But will everyone be able to afford them? Will one have to take a loan to be repaid over a decade perhaps in order to install the internal GPS module that a sailor's or pilot's job requires? And what if the technology in one's head becomes obsolete like all technologies do? Will one need to replace it using yet another loan? Will we have to write into our CVs when we apply for a job not only what we have learned in the past and what experiences we have, our past jobs, but also what enhancements we have installed into our bodies? And how will our children compete in school in their final exams with kids who have the latest memory enhancement unit installed? There certainly is a qualitative jump that occurs when an external functional support becomes an implant. Not only, for example, can schools then not exclude students from using their bodies with these enhanced abilities, but also when I take a job at the university, for example, now my employer is required to provide me with a desk, a computer, an office, light, so that I can do my work. But if I can see in the dark with an infrared sensor, if I can access the internet and create documents in collaboration with an AI chatbot in my head, then these external supports become obsolete. Instead, it is now my responsibility as the candidate for this job to have the right implants in place. Since they are part of my body, they are part of myself and they are in my responsibility. Having them on offer is, is as much my own responsibility as it is to offer my employer a healthy body or a logical or an educated mind. The employer's obligation to support me by providing the right conditions for my work is being slowly imperceptibly eroded. When the external supports become implants, they become my problem, the employee's problem. And not having them becomes a failure of myself, a lack, a disqualifying disability. So what do you think? Should we be afraid of this cyborg future, of this world of work? Or should we look forward to it? Tell me what you think in the comments. Thank you and see you next time. Bye-bye.